All right, we are going to read chapter 8 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens today. And uh, this is really to get some intermediate level, advanced level vocabulary. If you're not intermediate or advanced level English, don't worry, because uh, after each paragraph, we will try to summarize in very simple words what has just been said. It's pretty complicated to read this book, even for a native English speaker sometimes, because the language is a little bit old-fashioned or different. So we'll always summarize what is happening in very simple language. But along the way, we will also explore new vocabulary, advanced intermediate level vocabulary. All right, so let's get started with this. Let's see, we've got chapter eight. My holidays, especially one happy afternoon. When we arrived before, before day at the inn where the mail stopped, which was not the inn where my friend the waiter lived, I was shown into a very nice little bedroom with dolphin painted on the door. So when Davy went to school, they stopped at a little hotel, an inn, uh, and the waiter there took advantage of him. And now he's returning home, and he's just saying we stopped at a different inn, a different little hotel. And he said it was a very nice hotel room with a little dolphin painted on the door. Very cold I was, I know, notwithstanding the hot tea they had given me uh, before a large fire downstairs, and very glad I was to turn it into the dolphin's bed, pull the dolphin's blankets round my head, and go to sleep. Mr. Barkis, the carrier, was to call for me in the morning at nine o'clock. Uh, I got up at eight, a little giddy from the shortness of my night's rest, and was ready for him before the appointed time. He received me exactly as if not five minutes had elapsed since we were last together, and I had only been into the hotel to get change for sixpence or something of that sort. Okay, so wait, let's go back over that paragraph. <laughs> Mr. Barkis, so that's, you know, that's the uh, carriage driver who has always been carrying him to and from town near his home. Uh, was to call for me in the morning at nine o'clock. So Mr. Barkis, the, the person who usually transports him to and from the area where he lives, uh, it was supposed to come for him at nine o'clock in the morning. I got up at eight, a little giddy from the shortness of my night's rest. Now let's take a look at that word giddy. I'll put that up here. Let's see. Giddy. To me, giddy means something kind of like excited, full of energy. But let's just check the official definition. I don't really trust my definition on this giddy. Having a sensation of whirling and a tendency to fall or stagger, dizzy, make someone feel excited to the point of disorientation. So Davy was so excited to be going home and seeing Mr. Barkis come to pick him up at the little hotel, at the little inn, he got up at eight o'clock. Mr. Barkis was supposed to come and get him at nine. I got up at eight, a little giddy from the shortness of my night's rest. Okay, so he slept. He traveled all day. He slept in his little hotel room, uh, maybe not very much. So when he woke up the next morning, he was in a weird sort of excited state, a little bit disoriented. Okay. And was ready for him before the appointed time. So he was so excited, he got ready right away. He received me exactly as if not five minutes had elapsed since we were last together. So when, when Mr. Barkis came and received him, got him to take him home, it's as if they had never left each other, or as if he had only been gone five minutes, even though it had been a la maybe a half a year 
since the last time uh, he saw Mr. Barkas. And I had only been into the hotel to get a change for sixpence or something of that sort. As soon, well, let me get rid of the word giddy. We're done with that for the moment. As soon as I and my box were in the cart and the carrier is seated, the lazy horse walked away with us all at his accustomed pace, so they left the hotel very slowly. You look very well, Mr. Barkus, I said, thinking he would like to know it. Mr. Barkus rubbed his cheek with his cuff and then looked at his cuff as if he expected to find some of the bloom upon it, but made no other acknowledgement of the compliment. Well, bloom. <laughs> well, bloom is what happens when a flower becomes a flower, when it goes from green to a beautiful color. And if somebody is blooming, you can see, you can see their color. Uh, they look beautiful, they look young, they look vibrant. So, uh, he said, you, this is kind of complicated the way they're saying this. Mr. Barkas rubbed his cheek with his cuff, and then he looked at his cuff as if he expected to find some of the bloom upon it. So maybe Davy, this is what I'm interpreting. I could be wrong, but maybe, you know, Davy said, oh, you look very nice. And Mr. Barkas went like this and <laughs> tried to see if he could find some of that niceness on his cuff. This is a cuff. Uh, but made no other acknowledgement of the compliment. So he didn't say thank you or anything like that. He was saying, really? I don't look, I don't, I don't see it. I gave your message, Mr. Barkas, I said. I wrote to Peggotty. Ah, said Mr. Barkas. Mr. Barkas seemed gruff and answered dryly. Uh, now, so if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, Peggotty is Davy's nurse, the maid of the house where he grew up. And she's kind of like a grandmother to him. He really loves her. And uh, Mr. Barkis, when he was taking Davy away to school, he said, But if you write to Peggotty, tell her Barkis is willing. Davy has no idea what that means. But it seems that Mr. Barkis is very much in love with Miss uh, with Peggotty, he <laughs> wants to marry her, and Davy passed that message to her. I gave your message, Mr. Barkus. So Mr. Barkus is willing, in case you don't know or realize it. Willing also means wanting, like wanting to do something, having the desire to do something. Willing to do what? Well, Davy doesn't know, but I'm sure that when Peggotty read that, she understood willing to marry her, wanting to marry her desiring to marry her. Ah, said Mr. Barkus. Mr. Barkus seemed gruff. Let's take a look at that word gruff. Let me just put it up here. Gruff. I'm not even sure what I would say about that word. Let's check the official Google meaning. Rough, low pitch, abrupt, taciturn, and matter. So, so not very interested. Like pretending, you know, he, he's in love with Peggotty, but he doesn't want this little boy to know his feelings. So he said, oh, like he doesn't really care. He does care on the inside, but he doesn't want to show it. So I gave your message, Mr. Barkus. I said, I wrote to Peggotty. Ah, said Mr. Barkus. Mr. Barkus seemed gruffed and answered dryly. So he answered dryly, like in an uninterested way. Whoops. Tried to get rid of Mr. I tried to get rid of the word gruff here. Okay. Ah, uh, said Mr. Barkus. Mr. Barkus seemed gruff and answered dryly. Wasn't it right, Mr. Barkus? I asked after a little hesitation. Why, no, said Mr. Barkus. Not the message? The message was right enough, perhaps, said Mr. Barkus. But it come to an end there. Not understanding what he meant, I repeated inquisitively. Come to an end, Mr. Barkus? 
nothing come of it, he explained, looking at me sideways. So he didn't go like this, he just moved his eyes. So apparently, Davy passed the message, Mr. Barkus is willing, to Peggotty, but she never replied. He didn't receive any answer, so I guess its feelings were hurt. There was an answer expected, was there, Mr. Barkus, said I, opening my eyes, for this was new light to me. So Davy said, oh, uh, Peggotty was supposed to answer you? She was supposed to, to reply to this? When a man says he's willing, said Mr. Barkus, turning his glance slowly uh, on me again, it's as much as to say that the man's a-waitin' for an answer. So Mr. Barkus passed this message. He's willing, and uh, he was saying she should reply to that. That means something. Well, Mr. Barkus, well, said Mr. Barkus, carrying his eye back to his horse's ears. That man's been waiting for an answer ever since. Have you told her so, Mr. Barkus? No, growled Mr. Barkus, reflecting about it. I ain't got no call to go and tell her so. I never had six words. I never said six words to her myself. I ain't going to tell her so. So Davy's saying, why don't you go and tell her? He's saying, no, I don't even know her. You might tell her if you would, said Mr. Bark. You might tell her if you would, said Mr. Barkus, with another slow look at me. That Barkus was waiting for an answer, says you. What name is it? Her name. Ah, said Mr. Barkus, with a nod of his head. Peggotty. Christian name or natural name? Said Barkus. Oh, it's not her Christian name. Her Christian name is Clara. Is it though? Said Mr. Barkus. So Barkus is saying, well, I'm not going to say anything, of course, but if you want to, you can. Davy doesn't even really know uh, what they're talking about, I think. It's kind of a mystery to him. But uh, he's encouraging Davy to pass the message along that Barkus is still willing see if, or Barkus expects a reply. And then he learns her first name, which is Clara, but nobody calls her Clara. Everybody calls her Peggotty. He seemed to find an immense fund of reflection in this circumstance and sat pondering and inwardly whistling for some time. So let's put the word ponder here. Ponder. To, to ponder is to think about something very carefully or in a lot of detail. So when they say he sat pondering, so, he, you know, he's driving this cart with the horses, but you could see there's a look of thought on his face, like he's, he's thinking about something. Davy doesn't know what he's thinking about, but he can tell from the expression on his face he's, he's in thought, he's thinking about something. And that's what it means when it says he sat there pondering. It's pretty common to use it in that sort of situation. Okay, let's see. Let me take this down. Okay. <clears throat> well, he resumed at length. Says you, Peggotty. Barkus is waiting for an answer. Says she, perhaps, an answer to what? Says you, to, to what I told you. And what is that? Says she, Barkus is willing, says you. So he's, he's explaining to her how to go to Peggotty and approach her and tell her what he wants, which is, what is your answer to this phrase or to this idea that Barkus is willing, which means he wants to marry her. He wants to be her husband. This extremely artful suggestion, Mr. Barkus accompanied with a nudge of his elbow uh, that gave me quite a little stitch in my side. Let's put the word nudge up here. Uh, 
A nudge is a small push. So if you can imagine Barkus is sitting in the cart and Davy is sitting next to him and Mr. Barkus goes like this, <laughs> that's a nudge. Well, that's what I'm picturing here. I think that's probably what it is. Uh, it's something like that anyway. Let's see. Let's see how they use nudge again. Uh, Mr. Barkus accompanied, so he made this suggestion like, oh, go tell her. And he, and he does this as a little nudge. That's a, a small push. With a nudge of his elbow, they gave me quite a stitch in my side. So he said, ow, because Mr. Barkus is a big, strong man. And he didn't mean to hurt him, but it was a pretty powerful little nudge. After that, he slouched over his horse in his usual manner. Slouching is when you sit like this. So this is sitting straight up. This is having good posture. This is slouching. So he slouched over his horse in his usual manner. That's how he always drives the cart. And made no other reference to the subject except half an hour afterwards taking a piece of chalk from his pocket and riding up inside the tilt of the cart. Clara Peggotty. Well, he really loves Peggotty. Apparently as a private memorandum. So he just learned her first name, which is Clara, and he I guess he didn't want to forget it, or he thinks about her all the time, so he wrote the name on the side of the cart. Clara Peggotty. He really likes Peggotty a lot. Ah, what a strange feeling it was to be going home when it was not home, and to find that every object I looked at reminded me of the happy old home which was like a dream I could never dream again. The days when my mother and I and Peggotty were all in all to one another, and there was no one to come between us, rose up before me sorrow, sorrowfully on the road, that I'm not sure I was glad to be there, not sure, but that I would rather have remained away and forgotten, and forgotten it in Steerforth's company. So he was very excited to go home, but as they were getting closer to the home, he was thinking, it's not the same anymore. Before it was me and my mother and Peggotty, and we were all so happy and comfortable together, but now his mother has married this very mean man, and, she, and then his mean sister came to live with them. And uh, now he's kind of thinking as they get closer to home, I don't think I want to be here. I think I would prefer to go back to the school, actually, and be with my friends. But there I was. And soon I was at our house, where the bare old elm trees wrung their many hands in the bleak wintry air, and shreds of the old brook's nests drifted away upon the wind. The carrier put my box down. <laughs> I just lost my place. Sorry. <laughs> Let me find... The carrier put my box down at the garden gate and left me. Walk along the, walked along the path towards the house, glancing at the windows and fearing at every step to see Mr. Murdston or Miss Murdston lowering out of one of them. So Mr. Murdston, that's the new husband, the mother's new husband, and Miss Murdston is his mean witch of a sister. <laughs> no face appeared, however. And being, come, uh, and being come to the house and knowing how to open the door before dark without knocking, I went in with quite a timid step. So it, well, maybe we should put this word timid up here. That's that's a pretty good word to know. Timid. Timid means shy or a little bit afraid. So he knows how to open the door to his home. He remembers how to open the door to his home. But he hasn't been there in a long time. And so uh, he enters the door. He doesn't see There's nobody there to say hello to him, not even his mother. And so when he opens the door, he steps in, but he's a little bit shy. A little bit afraid. So he takes a timid step, uh, a, a hesitant step, a step, a shy step, a little bit afraid. A 
God knows how infantine the memory may have been that was awakened within me by the second of my mother's voice in the old parlor when I set foot in the hall. I've never seen the word infant being used this way, infantine. So infant is like a little baby. And uh, so I guess when they say infantine, that means like the memory of a baby, like a very, very young baby memory. I just want to, I've never seen infantine being used like that, or in, I've never seen the word infant being used like this. Let's see, infantine. Infantile, yes, infantine. Well, it says it's archaic, and now you would say infantile. And infantile means like a baby. So in modern English, you would say infantile. Okay, let's see. So God knows how infantile, we might as well use that word. Uh, my memory may have been. Uh, or what it awakened within me by the sound of my mother's voice in the old parlor. So when he stepped in, he heard his mother talking, and that almost brought him back to feeling like a baby. She was singing in a low tone. I think I must have lain in her arms and heard her singing uh, so to me when I was just a baby. So that's, he's hearing her singing, and it's kind of making him feel like or bringing him back to when he was a baby. The strain was new to me, and yet it was so old that it filled my heart brim uh, it filled my heart brimful like a friend come back from a long absence. I believed from the solitary and thoughtful way in which my mother murmured her song that she was alone, and when I went softly into the room, she was sitting by the fire, suckling an infant whose tiny hand she held against her neck. Her eyes were looking down upon its face, and she sat singing to it. I was so far right that she had no other companion. I spoke to her, and she started and cried out. Uh, start, <laughs> you, I'm sure you know that word start means begin something, but especially in the past, you can still use it this way now. I'm not sure how common it is, but start can also mean surprised. Maybe you know the word startled which means surprised or scared or something, shocked, something like that. And it's the same word. To start means to be surprised, to be shocked. So he says, I spoke to her and she started. So she was just sitting there singing to a little baby. And then she heard her son's voice and she was very surprised. She started and cried out. But seeing me, she called, her, she called me her, her dear Davy, her own boy and coming half across the room to meet me, kneeled down to the ground and kissed me and laid my head down on her bosom near the little creature that was nestling her, that was nestling there, and put its hand up to my lips. I wish I had died. I wish I had died then, that the feeling in my heart, I should have been more fit for heaven than I ever have been since. Here is your brother, said my mother, fondling me. Davy, my pretty boy, my poor child. Then she kissed me more and more. So here's Davy surprising his mother. His mother is sitting there singing to the baby, and Davy comes in and shocks her. He starts her. Okay, I have to take uh, like a one-minute break. I'll <laughs> be right back.
Okay. We're back. Let's see. This she was doing when Peggotty came running in and bounced down on the ground beside us and went mad about us both for a quarter of an hour. <coughs> Sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> okay, it seemed to me that I had not been expected so soon. So it seems like Davy arrived early. They knew he was coming, but they were surprised that he had arrived so early. The carrier being much more before his usual time. It seemed, too, that Mr. and Miss Murdston had gone out upon a visit in the neighborhood and would not return before night. I had never hoped for this. I had never thought it possible that we three could be together undisturbed once more. And I felt for the first time as if the old days were come back. We dined together by the fireside. Peggotty was in attendance to wait upon us, but my mother wouldn't let her do it and made her dine with us. So, uh, so they had dinner together and Peggotty, who is a servant, but she's also kind of part of the family. She tried to, to serve the dinner, but the mother wouldn't let her. Instead, she insisted that Peggotty sit down and join them. I had my own plate with a brown view, with a brown view of a man of war in full sail upon it. I guess he's talking about the, maybe the design on the plate, which Peggotty had hoarded somewhere all the time I had been away and would not have had broken. She said for a hundred pounds, I had my own mug with David on it and my own little knife and fork that wouldn't cut. So actually when he left, it seems like when he left the school or when he left for school, Peggotty put away his old plate and his old cup and his old silverware and she kept it protected and safe. And so uh, now that he was back, she brought it out so he could use his, his old eating utensils. Peggotty said my mother, what's the matter? Peggotty only laughed the more and held her spoon tight over her face when my mother tried to pull it away and sat as if her head were in the bag. What? Uh, let's try that again. While we were at the table, I thought it a favorable occasion, uh, occasion to tell Peggotty about Mr. Barkis, who before I had finished what I had to tell her, began to laugh and threw her apron over her face. So uh, remember the, the conversation that, that Davy had with Mr. Barkis in the cart. Uh, Davy decided to talk to Miss uh, to talk to Peggotty about it while they were having dinner, and she was so embarrassed she threw her apron. So she was embarrassed and she was laughing, and she threw her, she wanted to hide her laughing. She threw her apron over her face to hide the laughter. Peggotty said, "My mother, what's the matter?" Peggotty only laughed more and held her spoon tight over her face when her mother tried to pull it away when my mother tried to pull it away and sat as if her head were in a bag. What are you doing, you stupid creature? said my mother, laughing. Oh, drat that man, cried Peggotty. He wants to marry me. It would be a very good match for you, wouldn't it? said my mother. Oh, I don't know, said Peggotty. Don't ask me. I wouldn't have him if he was made of gold, nor I wouldn't have anybody. Then why don't you tell him so, you ridiculous thing, said my mother. Tell him, retorted Peggotty, looking at <laughs> Tell him? Tell him. Wait, tell him so, reported Peggotty, retorted Peggotty. He's never said a word to me about it. He knows better. If he was to make so bold as say a word to me, I should slap his face. So 
So she says, I'm not going to talk to him. He doesn't even talk to me. He knows it's a bad idea. And if he ever tried to talk to me, I would, I would slap his face. Her own was red as ever as I saw it, or any other face, I think. But she only covered it again for a few moments at a time, when she was taken with a violent fit of laughter, and after two or three of those attacks, went on with her dinner. So she keeps, <laughs> they're trying to have dinner, and she keeps laughing because uh, I guess she's embarrassed by the whole situation of this man being in love with her. I remarked to my mother, though she smiled when Peggotty looked at her, uh, became more serious and thoughtful. I had seen at first that she was changed. Her face was pretty still, but it looked careworn and too, little, and too delicate, and her hand was so thin and white, it seemed to me to be almost transparent. But the change to which I now refer was super added to this, super added. Is that a word that we use now? I've never seen that word before. Super added. It's not an important vocabulary word. Well, super added can mean one thing added onto another, but I don't think it's a very common word. I've never seen anybody use that before. Let's see. Uh, but the change to which I now refer was super added to this. It was in her manner, which became anxious and fluttered. At last, she said, putting out her hand and laying it affectionately on the hand of her old servant. Peggy, dear, you're not going to be married. Me, ma'am, returned Peggy, staring. Lord bless you, no. Not just yet, said my mother tenderly. Never, cried Peggotty. My mother took her hand and said, Don't leave me, Peggotty. Stay with me. It will not be for long, perhaps. What should I ever do without her? Oh, so now the mother is worried that, you know, Peggotty is saying, No, I'll, I'll never marry that man. But she can tell Peggotty is interested. She likes the attention. She keeps laughing. She's very embarrassed by the whole situation. And her mother is, uh, Davy's mother, is afraid. She says, don't you, please don't marry. Please, uh, I need you here with me. Because she's in a very abusive relationship with her new husband and his mean sister. And it's interesting that she says, uh, wait, let's reread that again. Her mother, her mother took her hand and said, don't leave me, Peggy. Stay with me. It won't be for long, perhaps. So her mother thinks, uh, Davy's mother thinks, Maybe she'll be dead soon. Otherwise, why would she say that? It won't be for long. Stay with me. It won't be a long time. She thinks something bad is going to happen. What should I ever do without you? Me leave you, my precious, cried Peggotty. Not for all the world. And his wife. Why, what's that in your silly little head? <clears throat> for Peggotty had been used to old uh, of old to talk to my mother sometimes like a child. So Peggy, because you know the mother isn't very powerful or uh, uh, what's the opposite of she's not very dominant the mother. She was very young and Peggy was kind of old. So when her first husband died, I think uh Peggy had a lot of control because the mother didn't really know what to do. And she's still like that. And 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 uh, it's saying here that Peggy sometimes talked to the to to his mother like a little, ch even though she's the servant, <laughs> she used to talk to her like a little child. I should like to catch her at it. No, no, no," said Peggy, shaking her head and folding her arms. "Not she, my dear. It isn't that there ain't some cats." That would be well enough pleased if she did, but they shan't be pleased. Wait, I'm very, I'm very confused by this. Let's let's read this again. But my mother made no answer except to thank her, and Peggy went running on in her own fashion. Me leave you? Uh, I think I see myself. Peggy 
go away from you. What? I should like to catch her at it. Oh, Peggy. Oh, okay. This is the thing that's confusing is Peggy is talking to her, talking about herself in the third person. So this she that she's talking about is herself. Me leave you? I think I see myself. Peggy, go away from you? This is Peggy talking. I should like to catch her at it. Like, I would like to see her go away from you. I would like to see her leave you. I, I, could, I can't imagine myself leaving you. No, 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 said Peggy, shaking her head and folding her arms. Not she, my dear. That means not me. She's talking about herself. It isn't that there ain't some cats that would be well enough pleased. So <laughs> when she's talking about cats, you know, cats like to hunt things like mice. They like to have victims. So I think in this case, when we say cats, she's referring to the Murdstons, the husband and the sister, her, her husband and his sister. But she can't name them because she's just a servant. She can't, she can't name uh, she can't say anything bad about these people, so she has to say cats. Uh, it isn't that there ain't some cats that would be well enough pleased if she did. So Mr. Uh, and Miss Murdston would be very happy if she left. That would make them very happy. If she did, but they shan't be pleased. They won't be pleased. They won't be happy because she would never leave. They shall be aggravated. I'll stay with you till I am cross, cranky old woman. <laughs> cross. Now, cross is another word for angry. It's pretty common. So cross. And then we have this word cranky. Let me put that's a good word. I want to put that up here. Cranky. Cranky. Cranky means in a bad mood. So if you're cranky, that means you're in a bad mood. And uh, sometimes it's used to talk about older people. A cranky old woman is a woman who is always in a bad mood, never happy. So she says, I'll stay with you till I'm a cross. That means angry. Until I'm a cross, cranky old woman. So until I'm an old woman who's always very angry in a bad mood. And when I'm too deaf and too lame, deaf means you can't hear, and lame means you can't walk. When I'm too deaf and too lame and too blind and too mumbly for what I want, for what, for, uh, for want of teeth. Okay, so mumbly, wait, I guess we better put mumble up here too. Mumble. Mumble is when you don't articulate your words, when you can't, uh, when, when you can't pronounce your words well. So this is normal talking, and this is mumbling. When you talk like this, when you sound like this, mumbling. And uh, that's so she says. And when I'm too mumbly for want of teeth, so when all of my teeth are gone, so you can't understand what I'm saying anymore. That's what she means by too mumbly for want of teeth. Uh, to be of any use at all, even to to be found fault with, then I shall go to my Davy and ask him to take me in. So she's saying, I'll never leave you. And when I get so old that I can't walk and I can't see and I can't hear, then I will go to Davy and Davy will take care of me. And Peggy says I, I shall be glad to see you and I'll make you as welcome as a queen. Bless your dear heart, cried Peggy. I know you will. And she kissed me beforehand in grateful acknowledgement of my hospitality. After that, she covered my head up with her apron again. Oh, she covered up her head so that she covered, she has her apron for working and she covered her head with her apron again. And had another laugh about Mr. Barkus. After that, I got dog hair on my face now from that. After that, she cleared the dinner table. After that, she came with another cap on and her work box and the yard measure. And she bit her wax candle uh, as all the same as ever. Okay. Let's see.
We sat around the fire and talked delightfully. I told them what, what a hard master Mr. Creakle was, and they pitied me very much. I told them what a fine fellow Steerforth was, and what a patron of mine, and Peggotty, uh, I think there's a, a misprint here. I told them what a fine fellow Steerforth was, and what a patron of mine, and Peggotty, it says sand, but I don't think that, I don't think that, oh, Peggotty said, that looks like an N, but it's Peggotty said. And Peggotty said that she would walk a score of miles to see him. So he was telling them all about his school experiences and how difficult it was. But he had this wonderful friend, Steerforth, and Peggotty really wanted to meet him. I took the little baby in my arms when it was awake and nursed it lovingly. When it was asleep again, I crept close to my mother's side, according to old custom, broken now a long time, and sat with my arms embracing her waist and my little red cheek on her shoulder, and once more felt her beautiful hair drooping over me like an angel's wing, as I used to think, I recollect, uh, and was very happy indeed. While I sat thus, looking at the fire and seeing pictures and the red-hot coals, I almost believed that I had never been away, that Mr. and Miss Murdstone were such pictures and would vanish when the fire got low, and that there was nothing real in all that I remembered, save my mother, Peggotty, and I. So because the Murdstones were gone, they weren't present at the time, it was really reminding Davy of the old times, almost to the point where he started wondering, do the Murdstons even really exist? Maybe it was all in my imagination. Maybe they would never come back, and it would just be the same as it always was. Peggy darned away at, stock, at a stocking, as long as she could see, and then sat with, one, with it drawn over her left hand like a glove, and her needle in her right, ready to take another stitch whenever there was a blaze. I cannot conceive whose stockings they can have been that Peggotty was always darning or, or where such an unfailing supply of stockings and want of darning can have come from. You know, I don't know exactly what darning stocks, socks are. I've heard that many times before, but I'm just curious. I guess it means like fixing them, like, you know, if there's a hole in the stock, to stitch up a small hole in a piece of clothing. So wait, let's just have a picture of darning, darning socks. Here is a, here we can use this picture here. So it's just like fixing, repairing socks, darning socks. I, I mean, I've seen that before, but I've, I've never really had any experience with that. I guess these days, if you have a hole in your sock, you just buy new socks. So it's a little bit different these days. But, you know, 150 years ago, 180 years ago, they would try to fix them this way. So uh, he's saying she was always darning socks, meaning she was always repairing socks. And he didn't know where did all these socks come from? Who owned all of these socks? Because she's always seemed to be doing it. I cannot conceive whose stockings they can have been that Peggotty was always darning socks. Or where such an unfailing supply of stockings and want of darling, darning came from. From my earliest infancy, she seems to have always been employed in that class of needlework and never by any chance in any other. So ever since he was a baby, he remembers her just sitting there repairing socks. And he was saying, where do these, where do these socks come from? Lord Peggotty, observed my mother, rousing herself from a reverie, what nonsense you talk. Well, but I really do wonder, ma'am, said Peggotty, what kind of put such a person in your head, inquired my mother. Is there, and is there nobody else in the world to come there? I don't know what they're talking about here. Let's see. I don't know how it is, said Peggotty, unless it's on account of being stupid, but my head never can pick and choose its people. They come and they go. And they don't come and they go, just as they like. 
I wonder what's become of her. Huh. Okay, let's see if I'm missing something here. How, how absurd you are, Peggotty, returned my mother. One would suppose you wanted a second visit from her. Lord forbid, cried Peggotty. Well then, don't talk about such uncomfortable things. There's a good soul, said my mother. Miss Betsy is shut up from her cottage by the sea, no doubt, and will remain there. At all events, she's not likely to ever trouble us again. Okay, so they're talking about Miss Betsy Trotwood, who is Davy's aunt. And the only time that she made an appearance in this book was in the first chapter when Davy was born. And she seems to be a very unpleasant person, a very non-likable person. So that must have been like maybe eight. I don't know how old Davy is in this, uh, maybe eight or ten. So um, suddenly Peg Peggotty's talking about her. And the mother is saying, why are you talking about this crazy woman? She's, you know, she's probably at her home. She has, she's never bothered us since that night. Uh, and Peggotty says, I don't know. It just popped into my head. Okay, so let's see. No, mused Peggotty. No, that ain't likely at all. I wonder if she was to die, whether she'd leave Davy anything. <laughs> so now she's wondering if, if uh, Betsy Trotwood dies, would she leave any money to Davy, her nephew? Good gracious me, Peggotty, returned my mother. What a nonsensical woman you are. When you know that she took offense at poor dear boys ever being born at all. When, when Davy was born in chapter one and uh, the aunt, Betsy Trotwood, came, she insisted that the mother is going to have a girl, a niece. And she was very upset when Davy was born and he was a boy and she left immediately because she was very angry and very upset that the mother uh, had given birth to a boy. So that's why she's saying that, uh, let's see, she took offense to Davy being born. I suppose she wouldn't be inclined to forgive him now, hinted Peggotty. So, and Peggotty is saying that well, eventually, I mean, she's, she's the aunt. She should forgive him for being a boy <laughs> eventually at some point. Why should she be inclined to forgive him now, said my mother sharply. Not that he's got a brother, I mean, said Peggotty. My mother immediately began to cry and wondered how Peggotty dared to say such a thing. As if this poor little innocent in its cradle had ever done any harm to you or anybody else, you jealous thing, she said. You had much better go to marry Mr. Barkis, the carrier, why don't you? I should make Miss Murdston happy if I was to, said Peggotty. So, uh, Peggotty, I, I guess, offended the mother by mentioning the newborn baby uh, in relation to Miss Betsy. Betsy Trotwood is really the dead father's aunt. So, uh, the mother was married to her nephew, and then he died, and then Davy was born. So she's really his great aunt. She's Davy's great aunt. So, and she has no connection to this new boy. But somehow that upset the mother that Peggotty mentioned this situation. And, and the mother is saying, you know, it's better just go away, go, go marry Mr. Barkis. That would be better for all of us. And Peggotty answers, well, that would make Miss Murdston happy. I think Peggotty is protecting the mother from the Murdstons. What a bad disposition you have, said Pe uh, Peggotty, returned my mother. You are as jealous as Miss Murdston, as it is possible for a ridiculous creature to be. You want to keep the keys yourself and give out all the things, I suppose. I shouldn't be surprised if you did, when you know that she only does it out of kindness and the best intentions. You know she does, Peggotty. You know it well. <laughs> okay, and... So, so the mother, I don't know if she's in denial, but, you know, the, the brother and, and the sister, Mr. Murdston and Miss Murdston, her husband and his sister, they're, they're really bad people. And Peggotty, I think, has been there protecting the mother. But the mother, 
sees them as, as teaching her and helping her. They're older and more experienced. So she says, you know, you're very mean to Miss Murdston, but she's just being very nice. She's just helping me. So the mother's in denial. She doesn't see uh, how, how bad this situation is. Okay, and then we've got muttering. Let's, let's put the word muttering up here. That's a good word. To mutter. Whoops. To, to mutter is when you say something under your breath. What that means is it's something that you want to say, but you would never say out loud because it could be offensive or not very nice or make someone angry. So that's the, so it's something you say very lowly. Like, uh, let's see, what would be a situation when you mutter? Uh, you know, maybe your friend says, hey, can you buy me a cup of coffee? And your friend, this friend is always asking you to buy them a cup of coffee. They never spend any money. So you say, yeah, I'll buy you a cup of coffee, you cheapskate. You like, you, you say it because you, you can't control it. You have to say it, but you don't say it loud because actually you don't want the other person to really hear or be offended. But at the same time, you want to express your anger. And this is muttering to mutter. So pe let's see, what does Peggy mutter? Uh, Peggy muttered something to the effect of bother the best intentions. Okay, so, you know, the sister, Miss Murdston, takes the keys to all the valuable things in the house and says, I'm going to teach you and help you. And uh, the mother doesn't get upset. She says, oh, that's good. She's helping me. I'm very inexperienced. I need help. And she says she only has the best intentions. So Peggy muttered, bother the best intentions like she she says it but it's very hard to hear it because she can't help saying it but she doesn't want to make the mother angrier so she she says it very softly under her breath is what that means uh peggy muttered something to the effect of bother the best intentions and something else to the effect of that there was little too much of the best intentions going on. So Peggy said, hmm, best intentions, yeah, right. Something like that. <laughs> I know what you mean, you cross thing. Remember, cross is another way of saying, saying angry, uh, said my mother. I understand you, Peggy, perfectly. You know I do. I wonder what you don't color up like fire. Let's see. What does that mean? I want, uh, you know I do, and I wonder you don't color up like fire. But one point at a time. Miss Murdston is the point now, Peggy, and you shan't escape from it. Haven't you heard her say over and over again that she thinks I am too thoughtless and too... pretty, suggested Peggy. Well, returned my mother, half laughing, and if she is so silly as to say so... Can I blame her? Uh, can I be blamed for it? So apparently, Miss Murdston, uh, according to, or according to Peggy's opinion, is jealous because uh, Davy's mother is very pretty. Uh, I'm just going to take a uh, one minute break. I will. I will be back in a minute. Just one second here.
Okay. Well, let's continue reading. Haven't you heard her say over and over again that on this account she wishes to spare me, uh, spare me a great deal of trouble, which she thinks I am not suited for, and which I really don't know myself that I am suited for. So the mother has very little experience running a house. And so the sister has come. Wait a minute, I'm getting a message saying that it can't hear me. I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Somebody is saying they can't hear me. But there's a very long delay on this, so that was a while ago. There are people still watching. Okay, I guess it's okay. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Let's see. So uh, the mother was very young when she got married to her first husband, and then she had Davy. She was very inexperienced. Then the father died, and it was just her and her baby, Davy, and the, the uh, Peggy, the maid. Uh, and she was very overwhelmed, if you know that word. Like, she couldn't handle everything that's happening. So, when she married Mr. Murdston and his sister moved in, she felt a little bit of relief because the sister said, Okay, you give me the keys. I will manage the house, the house for you because you don't know what you're doing. You're too young. You don't have enough experience. So, in a way, she felt gratitude for this because now the sister is handling everything. But also by taking the keys, she is taking control over all of the money, all of the valuables in the house too. And uh, the mother never complains because that would seem not very grateful. And if she does say anything, at first she did say things and the, and the sister said, okay, I'm leaving, you do it. I don't have to do this, I can go do other things. And the mother would say, no, 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 please stay. Help me. So let's see. Haven't you heard her say over and over again on this account that she wishes to spare me? Actually, let's put that word up here. Spare. To spare. To spare someone. We'll say to spare some. You could spare things also. But in this case, we're talking about people. So we'll say to spare someone. To spare someone kind of means like to save someone. So uh, let's see how they're using it here. Haven't you heard her say over and over again that on this account she wishes to spare me a great deal of trouble? She wishes to save me from the trouble of managing the house. That's what it means. She wishes to spare me. She wishes to save me from the trouble of managing the house. So she takes on all of the responsibility, but she's also now in charge of the money, in charge of the valuables of the house, which is the thing that Davy's mother is not seeing. And it says, which she thinks I am not suited for, which she thinks I, I can't handle it, I can't do it. But the mother agrees, otherwise she wouldn't have given her that power. Um, and I, I really don't know myself that I'm suited for. So she's saying, and she agrees, yeah, I don't think that I can handle it. I don't think that I can run a house. I don't think I can manage a house. And isn't she up early and late going to and fro? Maybe we should put that up here, going to and fro. Going to and fro. Which I guess you could think of as meaning to, to go to and from a place, meaning going this way and that way, going all different directions, going to all different places. Going to and fro means traveling around, doing things. It means she's busy doing things, doing activities, doing chores. Let's see. 
Uh, and isn't she up? Doesn't she get up early in the morning and stay late at night, going to and fro continually, leaving the house, coming coming to the house, and leaving the house, doing things for the house? And doesn't she do all sorts of things and grope into all sorts of places, coal holes and pantries, and I don't know where, that can't be very agreeable? And do you mean to insinuate that there is not a sort of devotion in that? So the mother is defending Miss Murdston, the evil sister of Mr. Murdston, saying she works so hard uh, managing the house for me. And are you saying that she's not a nice person? You, uh, I don't insinuate at all, Peggotty. And to insinuate something means to uh, say something indirectly. So when she says, are you insinuating she isn't a good person? She's saying, are you saying indirectly? Not directly, she's not a good person. But uh, are you saying things indirectly to, to give the meaning that she's not good? And Peggotty says, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. And the mother says, you do, Peggotty, returned my mother. You never do anything else except your work. You're always insinuating. You're always saying indirectly that the sister is horrible. She is horrible. <laughs> you revel in it. You revel in it. That means you enjoy it. <laughs> Let's see. You revel in it. And when you talk of Mr. Murdston's good intentions, I never talked of them, said Peggotty. No, Peggotty, returned my mother, but you insinuated. So she's saying no, but you always say it indirectly. You always say or do little things that make me think this. That's what I told you just now. That's the worst of you. You will insinuate. We keep, we keep saying this word insinuate. You keep saying it indirectly. You keep saying little things here and there that make me think that you think this. I said at the moment that I understood you and you see I did. When you talk of Mr. Murdston's good intentions and pretend to slight them, for I don't believe you really do in your heart, Peggotty, you must also you must be as well convinced that I am how good they are and how they actuate him and everything. If he seems to have been at all stern with a certain person, Peggotty, you understand, and so I am sure da does Davy, that I'm not alluding to anybody present. It is solely because he is satisfied that it is for a certain person's benefit. Okay. Oh, this is a little bit complicated, the way that they're talking here. Let's see. When you talk of Mr. Murdston's good intentions and pretend to slight them, so uh, when you say that Mr. to slight something means to maybe insult it, I guess would be a simple way to, to say that. To, to slight something is to, to dismiss or insult something as, as being not so good. So if you slight someone, like imagine I say hello to you, hi, and you ignore me and walk past me, that's a slight. It's kind of like uh, insult in a way. Uh, so when when you talk of Mr. Murdston's good intentions, like uh, he did this thing and he did that thing, and then you slight them, meaning you insult them, you say, oh, that wasn't really good. For I don't believe you really do in your heart, Peggotty, believe it. You must be as well convinced as I am how good they are and how they actuate him. So uh, you must believe that the things he does that are good it shows that he's good. If he seems to have been at all stern with a certain person. Okay, so now the mother is talking about a person, but she's also saying the person isn't here. So she doesn't mean herself. She doesn't mean Davy. I don't know who she's talking about yet. Let's see. So if he seems to be at all stern, that means like serious or hard, with a certain person, Peggotty, you understand and so I'm sure d does Davy that I'm not alluding to anybody present. So uh, she's talking about some person, but I don't know who it is. It's not somebody in the room. 
It's solely because he is satisfied that it is for a certain person's benefit. He naturally loves a certain person on my account and acts solely for a certain person's good. I don't know who he's talking about. He is better able to judge of it than I am. For I am very well for I very well know that I'm a weak, light, girlish creature, and that he is a firm, grave, serious man. So he's he's being very difficult with some person, I don't know who. And uh she's saying he only does it because he cares about me. And I appreciate that because I know that I'm a very kind, uh, innocent sort of person who would never treat anybody like that. And maybe this person needs to be treated badly. And he takes, said my mother, with the tears which were engendered in her affectionate nature, stealing down her face. He takes great pains with me. He goes through a lot of trouble for me. He does a lot of things for me that are inconvenient. And I thought it to be very thankful to him and very submissive to him, even in my thoughts. And when I am not Peggotty, I worry and condemn myself and feel doubtful of my own heart and don't know what to do. Peggotty sat with her chin on the foot of the stocking, looking silently at the fire. There, Peggotty, said my mother, changing her tone. Don't let us fall out with one another. For I couldn't bear it. Now let's put this phrasal verb to fall out here. To fall out. This means to ruin a relationship. Yeah, I don't think that we use it too much as a direct verb anymore, to fall out. No, maybe we fell out with each other. That means our relationship was ruined. It's used a lot as a verb. We had a fallout, which means we had a disagreement. And uh, that, that kind of ruins the relationship. Oh, where's John? Oh, I don't talk to John anymore. We had a fallout, which means our relationship kind of went down. Not a good relationship anymore. There, Peggotty, said my mother, changing her tone. Don't let us fall out with one another. So uh, we let's not ruin our relationship. We need to have our relationship. For I couldn't bear it. I, I could if, if you weren't with me, I, I wouldn't be able to survive. You are my true friend. You are my true friend. I know if I have any in the world. When I call you a ridiculous creature or a vexatious thing or anything of that sort, Peggotty, I only mean that you are my true friend and always have been ever since the night when Mr. Copperfield first brought me home here and you came out to the gate to meet me. So she's saying, please don't be mad at me that I called you these names. I didn't mean it. And you're my only friend in the world or my, my, my only real friend in the world. Peggotty was not slow to respond and ratified the treaty of friendship by giving me one of her best hugs. I think I had some glimpses of her real character in this conversation at the time, but I'm sure now that the good creature originated it and took her part in it merely that my mother might comfort herself with a little contradictory summary in which she had indulged. The design was uh, efficacious, for I remember that my mother seemed more at ease during the rest of the evening and that Peggotty observed her less. So I think Davy is saying that uh, Peggotty made the mother upset, knowing that she would make the mother upset. She did it because it was the only way she could get her mother to uh, really think about what was actually happening in the house. And it seemed to work because the rest of the night seemed very peaceful. When we had our tea and the ashes were thrown up, and the candles snuffed, I read Peggotty a chapter out of the Crocodile book in remembrance of the old times. So that was a book that they used to read together. She took it out of her pocket. I didn't know whether she had kept it there ever since. And then we walked about, we talked about Salem House. 
which brought me round again to Steerforth, who was my great subject. We were very happy that evening, as the last of its race, and destined evermore to close the volume of my life, will never pass out of my memory. Wait, let me read that again. Steerforth, who was my greatest subject, we were very happy, and that evening, as the last of its race, and destined evermore to close that volume of my life, will never pass out of my memory. I'm not sure what that means, as the last of its race, but I guess what they mean is that uh, this seemed to be a very significant night, like the end of a period of his life, and he will never forget that night. That's what I think he meant. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. Okay. It was almost 10 o'clock before we heard the sound of wheels. We all got up then, and my mother said hurriedly that as it was so late, and Miss, Mr. and Miss Murdston approved of early hours for young people, perhaps I had better go to bed. I kissed her and went up the stairs with my candle directly before they came in. It appeared in my, uh, to my childish fancy, as I ascended to the bedroom where I had been imprisoned, that they brought a cold blast of air into the house, which blew away the old familiar feeling like a feather. So when, when Davy and Mr. Murdston had that argument that caused Davy to be sent to the school, he, he was locked in his bedroom for a few weeks before they took him out and sent him away. And so that was like his little prison. So they before the Murdstons came in, they brought Davy to his bedroom, his prison. And uh, he says... It seems like when, when they came in, it wasn't a real feeling of cold, but it seemed like there was a cold air rushed into the house when they opened the door. And it blew away all the warm feeling that they had spent the night, you know, with Peggy and his mother and the baby in the room with the fire. But that was suddenly all blown away when the door opened and Mr. and Miss Murdston came in. I felt uncomfortable about going down to breakfast in the morning. As I had never set eyes on Mr. Murdston since the day when I committed my memorable offense, M Davy bit him. <laughs> However, as it must be done, I went down. After two or three false starts, halfway down, as many runs back on tiptoe to my room and presented myself in the parlor. So the next morning... He was very afraid to come down the stairs and see the Murdstons because he hadn't seen them since the day they had that big fight and Davy bit him. <laughs> so he tried several times to go down the stairs. He became afraid and ran back to his room. He did that several times. And then finally, he got the courage to go down. He was standing there before the fire with his back to it. While Miss Murdston made the tea, he looked at me steadily as I entered, but made no sign of recognition, whatever. So when Davy walked in, Mr. Murdston obviously saw him, but he didn't say hello. He didn't say anything. He just let Davy walk in. I went up to him after a moment of confusion, and I said, I beg your pardon, sir. I'm very sorry for what I did. I hope you will forgive me. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're sorry, Davy, he replied. The hand he gave me was the hand I had bitten. <laughs> I could not restrain my eye from resting for an instant um, a red spot upon it. But it was not so red as I turned when I met that sinister expression on his face. So Mr. Murdston extended his hand to shake his hand. And it was the same hand that Davy bit. And there was even a red spot on his hand. Maybe that wasn't related to the bite, because that was several months ago. But it was funny that there was a little red mark there. And he was looking at it, but then he looked at Mr. Murdston, and he saw that Mr. Murdston had a very serious, unfriendly expression on his face. How do you do, ma'am? I said to Miss Murdston. Ah, dear me, sighed, sighed Miss Murdston, sighing is like this. <sighs> so, ah, dear me. 
sighed Miss Murdston, giving me the tea caddy scoop instead of her fingers. So uh, she didn't she didn't want to shake hands with him. Instead, she just handed him like a spoon. How long are the holidays? <laughs> so so Davy's home for the holidays, the Christmas holidays. And Davy says, uh, hello, ma'am. And, and the sister says, oh, how long are the holidays? Like, when do you, when are you leaving? She's already tired of him. It's only been the first morning. A month, ma'am. And she says, counting from when? Like, when does that month start? Is it almost finished yet? <laughs> from today, ma'am. Oh, said Miss Murdston. Then here's one day off. So this is only day number one. She kept a calendar of the holidays in this way, and every morning checked a day off in exactly the same manner. She did it gloomily until she came to ten. But when she got into two figures, she became more hopeful. And as time advanced, even jocular. Uh, jocular comes from the same word as joke, so jocular means happy. So, so as, the, as the month progressed, and as she was very serious when it was single digit, she was watching every day, one, two, three, four, five, and she was very serious for the first 10 days. But then when it got to double digits, 11, 12, 13, 14, she became happier and happier. It was on this very first day that I had the misfortune to throw her though she was not subject to such weakness in, in general, into a state of violent consternation. Uh, it was on this, so on the very first day of his holiday, he had made her very angry. <laughs> I came into the room where she and my mother were sitting, and the baby, who was only a few weeks old, being on my mother's lap. I took it very carefully in my arms. Suddenly, Miss Murdston gave such a scream that I all but dropped it. So so they were in the living room and Davy took the little baby in his hands and, and Miss Murdston freaked out. My dear Jane, cried my mother. Good heavens, Clara, do you see? exclaimed Miss Murdston. See what, my dear Jane, said my mother. Where? He's got it, cried Miss Murdston. The boy has got the baby. She was limp with horror but stiffened herself to make a dart at me. So, so uh, I, is it Miss Murdston? Oh, so Miss Murdston came and grabbed the baby out of his arms very quickly and angrily. She then turned faint and was so very ill that they were obliged to give her cherry brandy. I was solemnly interdicted by her on her recovery from touching my mother any more on any pretense, whatever, my, touching my brother. So uh, he was no longer ever to touch his brother. And my poor mother, who I could see wished otherwise, meekly confirmed the interdict by saying, no doubt you're right, my dear Jane. So she just always agrees with the horrible Murdstons. On another occasion, when we three were together, the same dear baby, it was truly dear to me for our mother's sake, was the innocent occasion of Miss Murdston's going into a passion. My mother, who had been looking at his eyes as it lay upon her lap, said, Davy, come here. And I looked at mine. I saw Miss... I looked at mine what? Let's see. It was truly dear to me for my mother's sake was the innocent occasion for Miss Murdston's going into a passion. My mother had been looking at its eyes so, okay, so the mother was looking at the eyes of the baby as it lay upon her lap. Davy, come here, and looked at mine. Then she looked at his eyes. And I saw Miss Murdston lay her beads down. I declare, said my mother gently, they are exactly alike. I suppose they are mine. I think they are the color of mine, but they are wonderfully alike. So the mother was looking at the baby's eyes, and then she noticed Davy's eyes, and they're saying, oh, these eyes are exactly the same. My dear Jane, faltered my mother. Oh, what are you talking about, Clara? said Miss Murdston. 
my dear Jane, faltered my mother, a little abashed by the harsh tone of, its, of this inquiry. I find the baby's eyes and Davy's are exactly alike. Clara, said Miss Murdston, rising angrily, you're a positive fool sometimes. My dear Jane, remonstrated my mother, a positive fool, said Murdston. Who else could compare my brother's baby with your boy? They are not at all alike. They are exactly unlike. They are utterly dissimilar in all respects. Let's put that word utterly up here. That's a pretty good word. Utterly means completely, like 100%. So uh, how does she use, uh, they are utterly dissimilar. They are completely dissimilar. I hope they will ever remain so. I will not sit here and hear such comparisons made. And with that, she stalked out and made the door bang after her. So uh, the sister, Miss Murdston, was very insulted when she said that Davy and his brother were very alike. And she said they're opposites. And you should never say that again. That's a horrible thing to say. So she considered that an insult. In short, I was not a friend. I was not a favorite of, with Miss Murdston. In short, I was not a favorite there with anybody, not even with myself. For those who did not like me, could not show it. Oh, for those who did like me, could not show it. And even, uh, and those who did not showed it so plainly that I had a sensitive consciousness of always appearing constrained, boorish, or dull. So that was a very difficult for Davy because uh, Peggotty and his mother were not allowed to, to be nice to him. And Mr. and Miss Murdston were always very mean to him, which made him feel very awkward in, in front of everybody, no matter what the situation. I felt that I made them as uncomfortable as they made me. If I came into the room where they were and they were talking together and my mother seemed cheerful, an anxious cloud would steal over her face the moment of my entrance. So uh, if, if he was walking into a room you know, his mother loves him, of course, but because of the way the Murdstons were acting, suddenly his presence became very uncomfortable, even for the mother, because she couldn't be nice to him and she wouldn't be mean to him. So she was in a very uncomfortable situation whenever she saw him. If Mr. Murdston were in his best humor, I checked him. If Miss Murdston... Uh, no. If Miss Murdston were in her worst, I intensified it. I had a perception enough to know that my mother was the victim always, and she was afraid to speak to me or be kind to me, lest she should give them some offense by her manner of doing so and receive a lecture afterwards. So she was afraid to be nice to him in front of them because then they would they would tell her, why are you doing that? Why are you being nice to him? He's a bad kid. Therefore, I resolved to keep to myself. So he didn't want to cause all of this uncomfortable feeling. So he tried to be, as, he tried to be alone as much as possible. And many a wintry hour did I hear the church clock strike when I was sitting in my cheerless bedroom, wrapped in my little great coat, pouring over a book. Now let's put pour over here. That's a phrasal verb. Let's add it. To pour over something. To pour over something is to read something. Read something with a lot of interest and concentration. In the evening, sometimes I went and sat with Peggotty in the kitchen, 
There, I was comfortable and not afraid of being myself, but neither of these resources was approved of in the parlor. The tormenting humor which was dominant there stopped them both. I was still held to be uh, necessary in my poor mother's training, and as one of her trials could not be suffered to absence myself. Okay, wait. Let's read that again. That's kind of complicated. <laughs> in the evening, sometimes I went and sat with Peggotty in the kitchen. There, I was comfortable and not afraid of being myself. But neither of these resources was approved of in the parlor. Resources. So I guess the resources would be, let's see, I'm not afraid of being myself. Uh, I was comfortable and not afraid of being myself. Is he talking about those two things? The tormenting humor. Now, humor, you may you may know that humor means like funny. But especially in the past, not so much now, but uh, you know, especially at this time 170 years ago, humor could just mean like mood. So, tormenting humor means like a tormenting mood. Torment is like torture. So, tormenting humor would be like a torturous mood. So, you know, picture Davy walking into the parlor with Mr. and Miss Murdston. There was always this element of torture. No matter what he said, it was going to be wrong. Or uh, If he was happy, they would make him sad. Uh, they were very abusive towards him. So this is a very bad mood in the room whenever they're around. They're like dark clouds. That's what they mean by uh, tormented humor here. Not humor like ha-ha, but humor as in mood. The tormenting humor, which was dominant there, stopped them both. Uh, okay, so he must be ref referring to feeling comfortable and not afraid. But that always stopped whenever Mr. and Miss, uh, Miss Murdston were around. I was still held to be necessary to my, my poor mother's training. And as... The printing is a little bit hard to read here. And as one of her trials could not be suffered to absence myself. So uh, he was part of the mother's training to become more responsible. So he was necessary, even though they didn't like him being around. But they liked to use Davy to teach the mother how to be more responsible. As sulky as a bear, said Mr. Murdston, I stood still and hung my head. Let's put to sulk here, to sulk. To sulk means to feel sad or depressed or to feel sorry for yourself. Let me just check the official definition of sulk. To be silent, morose, bad-tempered, out of annoyance or disappointment. A period of gloomy and bad-tempered silence stemming from annoyance or resentment. So it's more like being angry because, or being uh, in a bad mood because you're angry or you're, you're upset about something. So uh, as sulky as a bear, said Miss Murdston. So she's talking about Davy and how she perceives him, what he looks like. He's as sulky as a bear. Well, he doesn't say anything because if he says something, they'll criticize it. So if he says nothing, then they also criticize that and say he's being sulky. I stood still and hung my head. Now, David, said Mr. Murdston, a sullen, obdurate disposition is, of all tempers, the worst. Obdurate. What does that mean? Obdurate. I don't know what that means. Obdurate. Stubborn, stubborn, refusing to change one's opinion or course. So it's kind of like obstinate. I don't think that's a word that people use anymore. I've never heard that before. And the boy, and the boys is, of, oh, and the boys is of all dispositions that ever I've seen. Remarked the sister, the most confirmed and stubborn, I think, my dear Clara. Even you must observe it. I beg your pardon, my dear Jane, said my mother, but are you quite sure? I'm certain you'll excuse me, my dear Jane, that you understand, Davy. So she's saying, 
well, maybe you don't understand him. He's not really like that, but you probably just don't understand how he is. I should be somewhat ashamed of myself, Clara, returned Miss Murdston, if I could not understand the boy or any boy. I don't profess to be profound, but I do lay claim to common sense. So she's saying, yeah, of course I understand him. He's just a boy. What kind of, how stupid do you think I am if I can't understand how a boy is? No doubt, my dear Jane, returned my mother. Your, your understanding is very vigorous. Oh, dear, no. Pray don't say that, Clara, interposed Miss Murdston angrily. But I'm sure it is, resum resumed my mother. And everybody knows. And everybody knows it is. I profess so much by it myself in many ways, at least that I ought to, that no one can be more convinced of it than myself. And therefore, I speak with great diffidence, my dear Jane. Uh, I assure you. Let's put. Let's look at the word diffidence. That might be a word that you hear, but it's not common. We're not going to focus on it, but I just want to define it. Diffidence, modesty or shyness resulting from lack of self-confidence. So a diffident person is someone who is shy because they're not confident. Let's see, who is being diffident? Probably the mother. Uh, I ought to, that no one can be more convinced of it than myself, and therefore I speak with great diffidence, my dear Jane, I assure you. We'll say I don't understand the boy, Clara, returned Miss Murdston, arranging the little feathers, uh, fetters on her wrist. We'll agree, if you please, that I don't understand him at all. He is much too deep for me. But perhaps my brother's penetration may enable him to have some insight into his character, and I believe my brother was speaking on the subject when we not very decently interrupted him. I think, Clara, said Miss Murdston in a low, grave voice, that there may be better and more dispassionate judges of such a question than you. Uh, so... <laughs> They're arguing as to whether or not you can understand Davy. And uh, the mother is saying that she does, you know, well, she's implying, she's insinuating. You know, we used that word earlier, insinuate. She's saying it without saying it, that she understands her son. But the Miss Murdston is saying, maybe you don't. We should find someone who doesn't have an interest in your son to try to understand him. She's biased, in other words, because she's his mother. Edward, replied my mother timidly, you are a far better judge of all questions than I pretend to be, but you and Jane are, uh, both you and Jane are, I only said. Oh, wait a minute. This is a little bit confusing. Edward, replied my mother timidly, you're a far better judge of all questions than I pretend to be. Both you and Jane are. So she's saying, uh, what is your opinion, Edward, her husband, about it? Because you, your opinion is much better. You're a better judge than I am. Both you and your sister are better at judging things than I am. You only said something weak and inconsiderate, he replied. Try not to do it again, my dear Clara, and keep watch upon yourself. So he's saying, you're being mean to my sister. Stop it. Be nicer later. <laughs> my mother's lips moved as if she answered, yes, my dear Edward. But she said nothing out, out loud. I was sorry, David, I remarked, said Mr. Murdston, turning his head and his eyes stiffly towards me. To observe that you are of a sullen disposition. You're always sad. You're never happy. I wonder why. <laughs> this is not a character that I can suffer to develop itself beneath my eyes without an effort at improvement. You must endeavor, sir, to change it. We must endeavor to change it for you. Now, we've already talked about this word endeavor, which means to try to do something very big or very important. So he's saying, you must endeavor not to be so sad or depressed. You must try really hard to not look sad or depressed or angry. 
And he says, we must endeavor to change it for you. We must try to, to help you do it. That doesn't sound good. It sounds nice <laughs> on one level, but you know, whatever they're going to try is going to be horrible. I beg your pardon, sir, I faltered. I think we used falter actually before too. Falter is to hesitate because you're afraid. So Davy's afraid to talk to these people. They're so mean to him. I beg your pardon, sir, I faltered. I've never meant to be sullen since I came back. So he's saying, I, I'm not trying to, to, be, uh, to look depressed or unhappy. Don't take refuge in a lie, sir. So that's just, don't lie to me. <laughs> he returned so fiercely that I saw my mother involuntarily put out her trembling hand as if to interpose between us. So they're talking, and the mother, who's afraid of everyone, for a minute she tries to get in between them so that they don't argue or fight, but she's too passive to do anything. So she just made a small movement, but she didn't actually do it. You have you have withdrawn yourself and your sullenness to your own room. So he's saying you just stay up in your room and you act angry and sad. Well, where's he supposed to go? Because when he comes down, they're very mean to him and abusive towards him. So he stays in his room. And now they're saying, they're complaining this is a bad thing to stay in your room. You know now, once for all, that I require you to be here, not there. Further, that I require you to bring obedience here. You know me, David. I will have it done. So he's saying, you have to be down here with, with us, and you have to, to, to just learn to, to deal with us. I will have a respectful prompt and ready bearing towards myself, he continued, and towards Jane Murdston. So he considers it an insult that Davy spends his time in his room alone. I will not have this room shunned as if it were uh, infected at the pleasure of a child. Sit down. So to shun means to uh, ignore. Kind of means to ignore. It means to maybe to reject. It's like ignore or reject. So he says, I will not have this room, the main room of the house. I will not have this room shunned. You will not reject this room. You will not ignore this room. You will come down here, not in your bedroom. So I will not have this room shunned as if it were infected. As, so he, he's saying, you can't stay, you can't insult us and stay up there and pretend we have some kind of disease down here that you're going to catch if you spend time with us. So he tells him, sit down. Okay, let's see. He ordered me like a dog, sit down. And I obeyed like a dog. So he, he, he listened, he sat. One thing more, he said, I observe you have an attachment to low and common company. Uh-oh. So, you know, he really loves Peggotty. Peggotty's like his grandmother. And now he's saying, I observe that you, would, you have an attachment to low and common company. Low meaning low status and common meaning uh, like a common person. He's talking about Peggotty. He's saying, I notice you spend time with Peggotty in the kitchen. You are not to associate with servants. The kitchen will not improve you in the many respects in which you need improvement. Of the woman who abets you, say nothing. Since you, Clara, addressing my mother in a lower voice, from old associations and long established fancies, have a weakness respecting her, which is not yet overcome. So he's saying, you can't spend time with Peggotty. She's a servant. And then he turns to the mother and says, and uh, you have to be more serious with her. You can't, you know, I know in the past you were like friends, but you can't do that anymore. You have to stop that. A most unaccountable delusion it is, cried Miss Murdston. I only say, he resumed, addressing, he resumed addressing me, that I disapprove of your preferring such company as Mistress Peggotty. And that is to be abandoned. Now, David, you understand me, and you know what will be the consequence if you fail to obey me the better. 
So he's saying, you better listen to me or else, or else something bad is going to happen to you. I know well better, perhaps, that he thought, as far as my poor mother was concerned, and I obeyed him to the letter. So I did everything he said. I did everything he told me. I retreated to my own room no more. I didn't, I didn't spend time in my room anymore. I took refuge with Peggotty no more. I didn't go spend time with Peggotty in the kitchen anymore, but sat wearily in the parlor day after day, looking forward to night and bedtime. So to be wary means to be very tired of something, to be wary. So when he says, I sat warily, it's not to be wary, it's sat warily. But he, he sat there and the, he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to be in the parlor in the living room. And he sat there very tired all the time. Oh God, here I am. I sat warily. I sat warily. Oh, let me move this down. Okay, where was it? I sat warily in the parlor day after day. So you can picture him. He hates being there. So he's just sitting there. Oh God, here I am. Looking forward to night. So he couldn't wait until nighttime came and he could go to bed and, and leave that room. What irksome constraint I underwent. Okay, we've got the word irksome here. I have to put that up. It's not the most common word. It's a good word, I think. But, you know, this is, this would be like... Uh, although, I guess, I guess it's probably an intermediate word. I would consider it advanced. I think most uh, English learners don't know this word, irksome, which is another way of saying annoying. It's not so common, but it's a, if you're trying to impress somebody on a test, like you're taking the IELTS or something... If you know this word irksome, which means like annoying, let me just check the official definition of irksome. Irritating, annoying. Yeah, it's just an, another word for annoying. Okay, what irksome constraint I underwent. So it was very annoying for him to have to do this, but he did it for his mother. Sitting in that in the same attitude, hours upon hours, afraid to move an arm or a leg, lest Miss Murdston should complain. Now he's been using "lest" a lot in this chapter, and we, I did an exercise about that in the last ch chapter. But in case you haven't seen it, this word "lest" is something that you use, and then you name something you're afraid is going to happen. You don't want this thing to happen. So he says, "I was afraid to move an arm or a leg." Lest Miss Murdston should complain. So he's af he's afraid if he moves, uh, even if he just readjusts his body. When he does that, Miss Murdston complains. So he's afraid to do it. So he says, afraid to move an arm or a leg. And what does the thing he doesn't want to happen is Miss Murdston should complain. Lest Miss Murdston should complain. And she did, on the least pretense. So she did complain. If he did anything, if he moved at all, she would complain. Of my restlessness, and afraid to move an eye, lest it should light on some look of dislike or scrutiny, what would find new cause com for complaint in mine? Uh, the way that this is written sometimes is very complicated. Let's read that again. Afraid to move an eye, lest it should light on some look of dislike or scrutiny that would find new cause for complaint in mine. Wait, okay, let's try this. Miss Mer oh. Afraid to move an arm or a leg, lest Miss Murdston should complain of my restlessness. And afraid to move an eye, lest it should light on some look of dislike. So he was even afraid to move his eye to see her uh, her disapproval that would find new cause for, for complaint in mine. What intolerable dullness to sit listening to the ticking of a clock and watching Miss Murdston, little shiny steel beads as she strung them 
and whether and uh, wondering whether she would never be married <laughs> And if so, to what sort of unhappy man, and counting the divisions in the molding of the chimney piece, and wandering away with my eyes to the ceiling among the curls and corkscrews and the paper on the wall. What walks I took alone down muddy lanes in the bad winter weather, carrying that parlor and Mr. and Miss Murdston in it everywhere, a monstrous load that I was obliged to bear. A day mare that there was no possibility of breaking in, a weight that brooded on my wits and blunted them. What walks I took, I'm just reading this paragraph again. What walks I took alone down muddy lanes in the bad winter weather, carrying that parlor. So uh, even when he went outside to go for a walk in his head, he was still thinking of Mr. and Miss Murdston in that parlor. A monstrous load I was obliged to bear. So that that image of them in, in his head was always there. A daymare. So you have a nightmare. That's like a horrible dream, right? So a daymare must be uh, a, a horrible dream that you're having during the day. <laughs> there was no possibility of breaking in. A weight that brooded on my wits and blunted them. So that, that image really affected him all the time. <clears throat> what meals I had in silence and embarrassment, always feeling that there were a knife and fork too many, and that mine. So uh, he always felt unwelcomed, like he was unwanted. And appetite too many, uh, that mine. Uh, plate and a chair too many, and those mine and somebody too many, and that I. So he always felt like he was an inconvenience and completely unwanted. What evenings when the candles came and I was expected to employ myself, but not daring to read an entertaining book, poured over, we just talked about that phrasal verb a few minutes ago, to pour over something means to read something very carefully. What is he pouring over here? Poured over some hard-headed and harder-hearted treatise, tr treatise on arithmetic. So, uh, of course, this is before TV and computers and all that great stuff. So uh, what people used to do is read books to each other at night by candlelight or by the fire. But those should be entertaining books. They should be entertainment. But not in this house. He was reading uh, essays on math <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> when the tables of weights and measures set themselves to tunes as rule Britannia or away with melancholy and wouldn't stand still to be learnt, but would go through, but would go threading my grandmother's needle through my unfortunate head, it at one ear, in at one ear and out the other. What? Right. So when evenings, when the can, I'm just reading this paragraph again because it's kind of complicated. The evenings when I was expected to employ myself, but not daring to read entertaining book. So uh, in the evenings when he was expected to read to the family, he wouldn't dare read an entertaining book, an interesting book, but instead he would read. Uh, <laughs> Essays on math. When the tables of weights and measures set themselves to tunes as rule Britannia or away with melancholy. Uh, I guess maybe a way that people used to remember a lot of information is maybe they would put it to songs. So we have these songs rule Britannia or away with melancholy because they were too hard to learn or memorize without some kind of device like a song. but would go through threading my grandmother's needle through my unfortunate head. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, in at one ear and out the other. But now this is an interesting phrase, in one ear, uh, out the other. So I'm just going to put this up here. In one ear and out the other. Because we use this even now all the time. 
And this is what you say when you talk to someone. You say, uh, what I'm telling you goes in one ear and out the other, meaning you don't you don't process what I'm saying. You're not listening to me. You're not concentrating on what I'm saying. I'm just saying the words and they go in this ear and then they come out this ear and nothing happens. So I think what he's saying is normally when you're reading something complicated like math or something like that, which requires a lot of memorization and a lot of numbers, I guess it would be easier to learn it if you set the, the words to a song. But he would definitely never try to make a song in front of these people. So he would just read the words and he wouldn't process the information, which could be valuable information, arithmetic. So instead he would read the words, but he wouldn't process it. It would just go in this ear and out the other. It was like he wasn't reading anything at all. That's how I'm interpreting it. Is that what he meant? I don't know, but that's what I think he meant. Okay. What yawns and dozes I lapsed into, in spite of all my care, what starts I came out of concealed sleeps with. So remember, start is like surprise. So the kind of start he's talking about is almost falling asleep and then going, that's starting out of sleep. So this is not start like begin. This is start like surprise. What starts I came out of concealed sleeps with. What answers I never got. To little observations that I rarely made. What a blank space I seemed. Which everybody overlooked. To overlook. Let's put that up here. To overlook something is to not see it. It's, it, it's there right in front of you, but you don't see it. That's overlooking something. So when Davy says that he was overlooked, that means he was there, but people didn't see him. They didn't acknowledge him. They, it's kind of like ignore here. It almost means like ignore. Let's see. Let's go back and see how he used it. Uh, what yawns and dozes I lapsed into in spite of all of my care. So he tried really hard not to go to sleep. But, or, or to yawn to show that he was tired. But what starts I came out of concealed sleeps with. So he was trying really hard not to sleep and then he would, he would, he would wake up really quickly. Uh, what, wait a minute. What answers I never got to little observations that I rarely made. What a blank space! What a blank! What a blank space I seemed, which everybody overlooked. So he felt like he didn't exist. He seemed like a blank space in the room that everybody ignored and didn't see. He was there, but nobody could see him. They overlooked him. And yet, was in everybody's way. So to be in somebody's way means to be uh, an inconvenience. So they ignored him. They pretended like he didn't exist. But when they felt like being annoyed, uh, then suddenly he was in their way. Suddenly he existed for negative reasons. What a heavy relief it was to hear Miss Murdston hail the first stroke of nine, the first stroke at nine, and order me to bed. So he was always very happy when it was nine o'clock and she would tell him to go to bed. He was so happy about that. Thus the holidays lagged away until the morning came when Mr. Murdston said, here's the last day off, gave me the closing cup of tea of the vacation. I was not sorry to go. I had lapsed into a stupid state. I was recovering a little and looking forward to steer forth, albeit Mr. Creakle loomed behind him. So. He hated being there. He was happy to go, and he was looking forward to seeing his friend Steerforth again at school. Although also, he knew that Mr. Creakle was there, who, who abused him and was very mean. So he knew that there were also bad things waiting for him at school. 
Again, Mr. Barkas appeared at the gate, and again, Miss, Miss Murdston, in her warning voice, said, Clara, when my mother bent over me to bid me farewell. So his mother wanted to say goodbye to him, but Mrs. Murds Miss Murdston was right behind her saying, no, leave him alone. Don't, don't, don't fuss over him. I kissed her and my baby brother, and I was very sorry then, but not sorry to go away, for the gulf between us was there. And the parting was there every, every day. And it's not so much the embrace she gave me that lives in my mind, though it was as fervent as could be, as uh, what followed the embrace. I was in the carrier's cart when I heard her calling to me. So she gave him a hug, and then he got into the carriage, the cart, to, to go away again. And as he was about to leave, his mother called out his name. I looked out, and she stood at the garden gate alone, holding her baby up in her arms to see me. It was cold, still weather, and not a hair of her head or a fold of her dress was stirred. Stir means move. So everything, it was cold, but everything was still. Nothing moved. And she looked intently at me, holding up her child. So I lost her. So I saw her afterwards in my sleep at school, a silent presence near my bed, looking at me with the same intent face, holding up her baby in her arms. So he, that's like a picture that's in his head that he can never forget. It's always there in his sleep, in his mind. He always sees that picture of her standing at the garden gate as he was leaving, going towards school. All right, and that is the end of Chapter 8 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. So I will take these vocabulary words that we talked about, and I will make videos about them so we can practice using these interesting and useful vocabulary words. And then we will continue to Chapter 9. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.